we're back with chapter three of The Call of the Wild. This chapter is titled The Dominant Primordial Beast. Remember at the end of the last chapter, we had Buck now in the Northland with men who are out there searching for gold. And he is one of a pack of nine dogs pulling sleds. And he's learning kind of the hard way how to survive but it is definitely changing him as a character. So we're going to pick up with chapter three. The dominant primordial beast was strong in Buck, and under the fierce conditions of trail life it grew and grew, yet it was its secret growth. His newborn cunning gave him poise and control. He was too busy adjusting himself to the new life to feel at ease, and not only did he not pick fights, but he avoided them whenever possible. A certain deliberateness characterized his attitude. He was not prone to rashness and precipitate action. And in the bitter hatred between him and Spitz, he betrayed no impatience, shunned all offensive acts. So what we can see there is they're describing his character for us. I'll go back to that really quick. Jack London is letting us know that yes, as in the last chapter, we are seeing changes in Buck, in his demeanor, and in his physical strength and ability, but he is still a top dog, if you don't mind the pun. He's not choosing to just be ruthless. He's being very deliberate in his actions. He's very careful. On the other hand, possibly because he divined in Buck a dangerous rival, Spitz never lost any opportunity of showing his teeth. He even went out of his way to bully Buck, striving constantly to start the fight which could end only in the death of one or the other. Early in the trip, this might have taken place had it not been for an unwanted accident. At the end of the day, they made a bleak and miserable camp on the shore of Lake Labarge. Driving snow, a wind that cut like a white hot knife, and darkness had forced them to grope for a camping place. They could hardly have fared worse. At their backs rose a perpendicular wall of rock, and Perrault and Francois were compelled to make their fire and spread their sleeping robes on the ice of the lake itself. The tent they had discarded at Daiea in order to travel light. A few sticks of driftwood furnished them with a fire that thawed down through the ice and left them to eat supper in the dark. Again, going back and really looking at this piece of literature, we want to see some of the things that we want to try to do as good writers when it's our opportunity. So it doesn't just say that they chose a really bad spot to make their camp and that they didn't have a tent, but they really draw the reader in and give them a visual image. Here, driving snow, a wind that cut like a white hot knife. Using this simile right here gives us all an image and darkness had forced them to grope for a camping place, you imagine them almost blinded doing that. So we need to try to use descriptions that get all of our senses involved, just like Jack London did here. Let's move on to the next paragraph. Close in under the sheltering rock, Buck made his nest. So snug and warm was it that he was loath to leave it when Francois distributed the fish which he had first thawed over the fire. But when Buck finished his ration and returned, he found his nest occupied. A warning snarl told him that the trespasser was Spitz. Till now, Buck had avoided trouble with his enemy, but this was too much. The beast in him roared. He sprang upon Spitz with a fury which surprised them both and Spitz particularly, for his whole experience with Buck had gone to teach him that his rival was an unusually timid dog who managed to hold his own only because of his great weight and size. Francois was surprised too 
when they shot out in a tangle from the disrupted nest, and he divined the cause of the trouble. Aha! he cried to Buck. Give it to him, Bygar! Give it to him, the dirty thief! Spitz was equally willing. He was crying with sheer rage and eagerness as he circled back and forth for a chance to spring in. Buck was no less eager, and no less cautious, as he likewise circled back and forth for the advantage. But it was then that the unexpected happened, the thing which projected their struggle for supremacy far into the future, past many a weary mile of trail and toil. I know we keep pausing, but it's really important that you understand some of the things that are going on here. The last sentence or two here, but it was then that the unexpected happened. We've got a bit of foreshadowing. Our minds are now anxious, trying to figure out, well, what is the unexpected? Oh my gosh. And it's projecting their struggle far into the future. What on earth does that mean? So let's read on to find out. A good book makes you want to keep reading. An oath from parole, the resounding impact of a club upon a bony frame, and a shrill yelp of pain heralded the breaking forth of pandemonium. The camp was suddenly discovered to be alive with skulking fury forms, starving huskies, four or five score of them, who had scented the camp from some Indian village. They had crept in while Buck and Spitz were fighting, and when the two men sprang among them with stout clubs, they showed their teeth and fought back. They were crazed by the smell of the food. Perrault found one with head buried in the grub box, his club landed heavily on the gaunt ribs, and the grub box was capsized on the ground. On the instant, a score of the famished brutes were scrambling for the bread and bacon. The clubs fell upon them unheeded. They yelped and howled under the rain of blows, but struggled nonetheless madly till the last crumb had been devoured. Wow. So a pack of wild dogs, not theirs, just took all of their food. That can't be good. Stop there, think for a moment, make a prediction. What could possibly happen next? In the meantime, the astonished team dogs had burst out of their nests only to be set upon by the fierce invaders. Never had Buck seen such dogs. It seemed as though their bones would burst through their skins. They were mere skeletons, draped loosely in draggled hides with blazing eyes and slavered fangs. But the hunger madness made them terrifying, irresistible. There was no opposing them. The team dogs were swept back against the cliff, the cliff at the first onset. Buck was beset by three huskies, and in a trice his head and shoulders were ripped and slashed. The din was frightful. Billy was crying as usual. Dave and Solex, dripping blood from a score of wounds, were fighting bravely side by side. Joe was snapping like a demon. Once, his teeth closed on the foreleg of a husky, and he crunched down through the bone. Pike, the, mal the maligner, leapt upon the crippled animal, breaking its neck with a quick flash of teeth and a jerk. Buck got a frothing adversary by the throat and was sprayed with blood when his teeth sank through the jugular. The warm taste of it in his mouth goaded him to greater fierceness. He flung himself upon another, and at the same time felt teeth sink into his own throat. It was Spitz, treacherously attacking from the side. So, that's great. They're all trying to ward off these invaders, and Spitz decides to take advantage and attack Buck. Perrault and Francois, having cleaned out their part of the camp, hurried to save their sled dogs. The wild wave of famished beasts rolled back before them, and Buck shook himself free. But it was only for a moment. The two men were compelled to run back to save the grub, upon which the huskies returned to the attack on the team. Billy, terrified into bravery, sprang through the savage circle and fled away over the ice. Pike and Dub followed on his heels, with the rest of the team behind them. As Buck drew himself together and to spring after them, out of the tail of his eye he saw Spitz rush upon him with the evident intention of overthrowing him. 
Once off his feet and under that mass of huskies, there was no hope for him. But he braced himself to the shock of Spitz's charge, then joined the flight out on the lake. Later, the nine team dogs gathered together and sought shelter in the forest. Though unpursued, they were in a sorry plight. There was not one who was not wounded in four or five places, while some were wounded grievously. Dub was badly injured in a hind leg. Dolly, the last husky added to the team at Daea, had a badly torn throat. Joe had lost an eye, while Billy, the good-natured with an ear, chewed to, and rent to ribbons, cried and whimpered throughout the night. At daybreak, they limped warily back to camp to find the marauders gone and the two men in bad tempers. Fully half their grub supply was gone. The huskies had chewed through the sled lashings and canvas coverings. In fact, nothing, no matter how remotely eatable, had escaped them. They had eaten a pair of Perrault's moose-hide moccasins, chunks out of the leather traces, and even two feet of lash from the end of Francois's whip. He broke from a mournful contemplation of it to look over his wounded dogs. What do you think would happen if already you don't have terribly much with you and now you're out already having been under attack with less than half the amount of food and supplies that you thought you were going to have for your journey? How would you feel? Let's keep reading to see how they feel. Ah, my friends, he said softly, Maybe it make you mad dog dose many bites. Maybe all mad dog sacredum. What you tink, eh, Perrault? The courier shook his head dubiously. With four hundred miles of trail still between him and Dawson, he could ill afford to have madness break out among his dogs. Two hours of cursing and exertion got to the harness into shape, and the wound-stiffened team was underway. Struggling painfully over the hardest part of the trail they had yet countered, and for that matter, the hardest between them and Dawson. The thirty-mile river was wide open. Its wild water defied the frost, and it was in the eddies only and in the quiet places that the ice held at all. Six days of exhausting toil were required to cover those thirty terrible miles, and terrible they were, for every foot of them was accomplished at the risk of life to dog and man. A dozen times Perrault, nosing the way, broke through the ice bridges, being saved by the long pole he carried, which he so held that it fell each time across the hole made by his body. But a cold snap was on, the thermometer registering fifty below zero, and each time he broke through he was compelled for very life to build a fire and dry his garments. Could you imagine that, falling into frozen water at 50 below? Oh my goodness, I can't even. Nothing daunted him. It was because nothing daunted him that he had been chosen for government courier. He took all manners of risks, resolutely thrusting his little weazen face into the frost and struggling on from dim dawn to dark. He skirted the frowning shores on rim ice that bent and crackled underfoot, and upon which they dared not halt. Once, the sled broke through, with Dave and Buck, and they were half frozen and all but drowned by the time they were dragged out. The usual, the usual fire was necessary to save them. They were coated solidly with ice, and the two men kept them on the run around the fire, sweating and thawing so close that they were singed by the flames. At another time, Spitz went through, dragging the whole team after him up to Buck, who strained backward with all his strength, his forepaws on the slippery edge, and the ice quivering and snapping all around. But behind him was Dave, and likewise straining backward, and behind the sled was Francois, pulling till his tendons cracked. Again, the rim ice broke away before and behind, and there was no escape except up the cliff. Perrault scaled it by a miracle, while Francois prayed for just that miracle, and with every thong and sled lashing and the last bit of harness rove into a long rope, the dogs were hoisted, one by one, to the cliff crest. Francois came up last, after the sled and load. Then came the search for a place to descend, 
which descent was ultimately made by the aid of the rope, and night found them back on the river with a quarter of a mile to the day's credit. By the time they made the Hudalinqua and Good Ice, Buck was played out. The rest of the dogs were in like condition, but Perrault, to make up lost time, pushed them late and early. Okay, so I'm going to pause right here for you. I don't know about you, but I do not know what this word means, Hudalinqua. I have this weird feeling that it's a thing because it follows the. So I know, because I remember my grammar rules, that the comes right before a noun. So I know that it's a noun. And I also know that it's something that is specific because it has capital H. So what do I do? I'm on a computer so I can look it up. Ah, yes, it's a place. Let's take a look. And then we can really get an image of where they are on this journey. It's in Yukon territory. Okay, so we see them crossing the ice. We knew that. There's rivers going on. I'm zooming out. And again, this is going to look different now than perhaps... Um, way back when, because, you know, civilization, but we want to see. Okay, so they're in this Yukon territory, and it looks real tiny here, but remember, they started off by the coast here, so they're already at this point, and they're going to Where was it? Let's take a look back and we'll figure that out. Daiea was a place. So let's look at that. Hmm. Did I spell it right? D Y E A. Daiea. So let's see where that is. Okay, so that's definitely that's where they seem to have started. And then they went this way. Take a look. All right. So we know that this is a place, not a person, because capital H lets us know it's a place after the. By the time they made the Hudalinqua and Good Ice, Buck was played out. The rest of the dogs were in like condition. But Perrault, to make up lost time, pushed them late and early. The first day they covered 35 miles to the big salmon. The next day, 35 more to the little salmon. The third day, 40 miles, which brought them well up toward the five fingers. Okay, so that just gave me an idea. And so I wanted to see um, if they have a map available, which I kind of figured they do because this book's been around for a while. So I found a map for us of the Call of the Wild, um, all of the different places. And obviously we are only knowing a few of these so far. So remember that it starts down here in Southern California, and then Buck is shipped by baggage car up to Seattle, and then he ends up in technically Alaska uh, to start off. And then the journey gets um, to be the part where he is actually on a sled and this is the path that it seems to go. And that's his final destination. Um, the end point. Oopsies. 
I zoomed in too far. But so we want to be able to keep that for ourselves. So I'll be able to keep that up and keep coming back to it for us. So toward the five fingers. Buck's feet were not so compact and hard as the feet of the huskies. His had softened during the many generations since his since the day his last wild ancestor was tamed by a cave dweller or a river man. All day long he limped in agony, and camp once made lay down like a dead dog. Hungry as he was, he would not move to receive his ration of fish, which Francois had to bring to him. Also, the dog driver rubbed Buck's feet for half an hour each night after supper, and sacrificed the tops of his own moccasins to make four moccasins for Buck. This was a great relief, and Buck caused even the weazened face of Perrault to twist itself into a grin one morning, when Francois forgot the moccasins and Buck lay on his back, his forefeet waving appealingly in the air, and refused to budge without them. Later his feet grew hard to the trail, and the worn-out footgear was thrown away. Can you imagine that, the dog laying with his feet up like, Please put my shoes on me! At the Pelly one morning, as they were harnessing up, Dolly, who had never been conspicuous for anything, went suddenly mad. She announced her condition by a long, heartbreaking wolf howl that sent every dog bristling with fear, then sprang straight for Buck. He had never seen a dog go mad, nor did he have any reason to fear madness, yet he knew that here was horror, and fled away from it in a panic. Straight away he raced, with Dolly panting and frothing one leap behind. <laughs> nor could she gain on him, so great was his terror. Nor could he leave her, so great was her madness. He plunged through the wooden breast of the island, flew down to the lower end, crossed a, black, a back channel filled with rough ice to another island, gained a third island, curved back to the main river, and in desperation started to cross it. And all the time, though he did not look, he could hear her snarling just one leap behind. Francois called to him a quarter of a mile away, and he doubled back, still one leap ahead, gasping painfully for air and putting all his faith in that Francois would save him. The dog driver held the axe poised in his hand, and as Buck shot past him, the axe crashed down upon Mad Dolly's head. Now, we're trying to talk about the importance of description when we're reading a story and when we turn around and write a story. And this is a paragraph here that I want you to stop for a minute and in your reader's notebook, I want you to draw this out as like a little cartoon. What does this look like? Because all this description created some kind of a mental picture in your head. So now is the perfect time to pause and to try that out. Okay. Can't wait to see those pictures. We're going to continue. Buck staggered over against the sled, exhausted, sobbing for breath, helpless. This was Spitz's opportunity. He sprang upon Buck, and twice his teeth sank into his unresisting foe, and ripped and tore the flesh to the bone. Then Francois's lash descended, and Buck had the satisfaction of watching Spitz receive the worst whipping as yet administered to any of the teams. "'One devil, dat Spitz,' remarked Perrault. "'Some damn day he'll kill dat Buck.' "'Dat Buck, two devils,' was Francois's rejoinder. Now. That's a word you don't see very often. But use context clues. Perrault makes a remark, and then Francois responds. So what do we think rejoinder means? Let's take a look. A reply, absolutely especially a sharp or witty one. So, that makes sense, because he made a remark and then he responded. Response, reply, rejoinder, new word for you. All the time, 
I watch dat buck I know for sure. Listen, some damn fine day him get mad lack hell and den him chew dat spits all up and spit him out on de snow. Sure, I know. I don't know. I'm making the accent up. But that's how it sounds to me in my head. From then on, it was war between them. Spitz, as lead dog and acknowledged master of the team, felt his supremacy threatened by this strange Southland dog. And strange Buck was to him, for of the many Southland dogs he had known, not one had shown up worthily in the camp and on the trail. They were all too soft, dying under the toil, the frost, and the starvation. Buck was the exception. He alone endured and prospered, matching the husky in strength, savagery, and cunning. Then he was a masterful dog, and what made him dangerous was the fact that the club of the man in the red sweater had knocked all blind pluck and rashness out of his desire for mastery. He was preeminently cunning and could bide his time with a patience that was nothing less than primitive. So you see, there's a contrast here between the two dogs. Both are lead dogs, master dogs, I guess is the way that London writes about them. But Spitz is born the dog for this, whereas Buck has made a transition to this, and Spitz didn't see that coming. It's dangerous. It was inevitable that the clash for leadership should come. Buck wanted it. He wanted it because it was his nature, because he had been gripped tight by that nameless, incomprehensible pride of the trail and trace, that pride which holds dogs in the toil to the last gasp, which lures them to die joyfully in the harness and breaks their hearts if they are cut out of the harness. This was the pride of Dave as wheel dog, of Solex as he pulled with all his strength, the pride that laid hold of them at break of camp, transforming them from sour and sullen brutes into straining, eager, ambitious creatures, the pride that spurred them on all day and dropped them at pitch of camp at night, letting them fall back into gloomy unrest and uncontent. This was the pride that bore up spits and made him thrash the sled dogs who blundered and shirked in the traces or hid away at harness-up time in the morning. Likewise, it was this pride that made him fear Buck as a possible lead dog. And this was Buck's pride, too. This paragraph seems to be giving us a little bit of foreshadowing as to a potential conflict. Take a moment and figure out what might be being foreshadowed here. Now that you have thought about the potential conflicts and whether they're external, internal, or if they're external, who would they involve? Um, let's keep reading. We've got a little bit more left in this chapter. He openly threatened the other's leadership. He came between him and the shirks he should have punished, and he did it deliberately. One night there was a heavy snowfall, and in the morning Pike, the maligner, did not appear. He was securely hidden in his nest under a foot of snow. Francois called him and sought him in vain. Spitz was wild with wrath. He raged through the camp, smelling and digging in every likely place, snarling so frightfully that Pike heard and shivered in his hiding place. But when he was at last unearthed and Spitz flew at him to punish him, Buck flew with equal rage in between. Oh, that's not necessarily a great idea. What's Buck thinking? So unexpected was it, and so shrewdly managed, that Spitz was hurled backward and off his feet. Pike, who had been trembling abjectly, took heart at this open mutiny and sprang upon his overthrown leader. Buck, to whom fair play was a forgotten code, likewise sprang upon Spitz, but Francois, chuckling at the incident while unswerving in the administration of justice, brought his lash down upon Buck with all his might. This failed to drive Buck from his prostrate rival, and the butt of the whip was brought into play. Half stunned by the blow, Buck was knocked backward and the lash laid upon him again and again, while Spitz soundly punished the many times offending Pike. In the days that followed, as Dawson grew closer and closer, Buck still continued to interfere between Spitz and the culprits, 
but he did it craftily when Francois was not around. With the covert mutiny of Buck, a general insubordination sprang up and increased. Dave and Solex were unaffected, but the rest of the team went from bad to worse. Things no longer went right. There was continual bickering and jangling. Trouble was always afoot, and at the bottom of it was Buck. He kept Francois busy, for the dog driver was in constant apprehension of the life and death struggle between the two, which he knew must take place sooner or later. And on more than one night the sounds of quarreling and strife among the other dogs turned him out of his sleeping robe, fearful that Buck and Spitz were at it. So Buck is actually acting somewhat as an antagonist here, even though he's our protagonist. He's intentionally causing problems, trying to gain leadership. Or, you know, like I said earlier, be top dog. But the opportunity did not present itself, and they pulled into Dawson one dreary afternoon with the great fight still to come. Here were many men and countless dogs, and Buck found them all at work. It seemed the ordained order of things that dogs should work. All day they swung up and down the main street in long teams, and in the night their jingling bells still went by. They hauled cabin logs and firewood, freighted up to the mines, and did all manner of work that horses did in the Santa Clara Valley. Here and there Buck met Southland dogs, but in the main, le in the main they were in the wild wolf-husky breed. Every night, regularly at nine and twelve, at three, they lifted a nocturnal song, a weird and eerie chant in which it was Buck's delight to join. With the aurora borealis flaming coldly overhead, or the stars leaping in the frost dance, and the land numb and frozen under its pall of snow, this song of the huskies might have been the defiance of life, only it was pitched in minor key, with long-drawn wailings and half-sobs, and was more the pleading of life, the articulate travail of existence. It was an old song, old as the breed itself, one of the first songs of the younger world in a day when songs were sad. It was invested with the woe of unnumbered generations, this plaint by which Buck was so strangely stirred. When he moaned and sobbed, it was with the pain of living that was of old, the pain of his wild fathers, and the fear and mystery of the cold and dark that was to them fear and mystery and that he should be stirred by its marked by it marked the completeness with which he harked back through the ages of fire and roof to the law to the raw beginnings of life in the howling ages why on earth does jack london take an entire paragraph to describe the wail the the howling of a dog think about that for a minute what did you come up with? Seven days from the time they pulled into Dawson, they dropped down the steep bank by the barracks to the Yukon Trail and pulled for Daea in salt water. Perrault was carrying dispatches, if anything more urgent than those he had brought in. Also, the travel pride had gripped him, and he proposed to make the record trip of the year. Several things favored him in this. The week's rest had recuperated the dogs and put them in through trim, thorough trim. My apologies. The trail they had broken into the country was packed hard by later journeyers, and, further, the police had arranged in two or three places deposits of grub for dog and man, and he was traveling light. They made 60 mile, which is a 50 mile run, on the first day, and the second day saw them booming up the Yukon well on their way into Pelly. But such splendid running was achieved not without great trouble and vexation on the part of Francois. Now, pause there. If you don't know what vexation is, think about what it means to be vexed. And if you don't know that, what does shun or ation mean as a suffix? Pause for a second. Okay, if you're vexed, you're annoyed or angered. And shun makes something like the state of being. Let's keep going. The insidious revolt led by Buck has, had destroyed the solidarity of the team. It no longer was as one dog leaping in the traces. 
The encouragement Buck gave the rebels led them into all kinds of petty misdemeanors. No more was Spitz a leader greatly to be feared. The old awe departed, and they grew equal to challenging his authority. Pike robbed him of half a fish one night and gulped it down under the protection of Buck. Another night, Dub and Joe fought Spitz and made him forego the punishment they deserved. And even Billy, the good-natured, was less good-natured, and why not half so placatingly as in former days. Buck never came near Spitz without snarling and bristling menacingly. In fact, his conduct approached that of a bully, and he was given to swaggering up and down before Spitz's very nose. All this conflict that's building between the dogs, what do you think's going to happen? Hmm. The breaking down of discipline likewise affected the dogs in their relations with one another. They quarreled and bickered more than ever among themselves, till at times the camp was a howling bedlam. David and Solex alone were unaltered, though they were made irritable by the unending squabbling. Francois swore strange barbarous oaths and stamped the snow in futile rage and tore his hair. His lash was always singing among the dogs, but it was of small avail. Directly his back was turned, they were at it again. He backed up Spitz with his whip, while Buck backed up the remainder of the team. Francois knew he was behind all the trouble, and Buck knew he knew, but Buck was too clever ever again to be caught red-handed. He worked faithfully in the harness, for the toil had become a delight to him, yet it was a greater delight slyly to precipitate a fight amongst his mates and tangle the traces. If you're a middle child, like I am, you understand that there's sometimes joy in uh, causing conflict. I'm not proud of that, but uh, it's something to which I can relate to Buck. Probably one of the only things that I think I can relate to a dog, but... Uh, We've got to find some way, shape, or form to try to relate. So is there any way you can relate? Think about it. Then keep going. At the mouth of the Takahina, I'm going to guess that that's a river because it's capitalized, so we know it's a proper noun, and it follows the word the, which lets us know a noun follows it. And the mouth. When we talk about something having a mouth, we're usually talking about a river. So at the mouth of the Takahina, one night after supper, Dub turned up a snowshoe rabbit, blundered it, and missed. In a second, the whole team was in full cry. A hundred yards away was a camp of the Northwest Police, with fifty dogs, huskies and all, who joined the chase. The rabbit sped down the river, turned off into a small creek, up the frozen bed of which it held steadily. It ran lightly on the surface of the snow, while the dogs plowed through by main strength. Buck led the pack sixty strong, around a bend after bend, but he could not gain. He lay down low to the race, whining eagerly, his splendid body flashing forward, leap by leap in the wan white moonlight. And leap by leap, like some pale frost wraith, the snowshoe rabbit flashed on ahead. All that stirring of old instincts which at stated period drives men out from the sounding cities to forest and plain to kill things by chemically propelled leaden pellets. By gun. That was a fancy way of saying by gun. The bloodlust, the joy to kill, all this was Buck's. Only it was infinitely more intimate. He was raging at the head of the pack, running the wild thing down, the living meat to kill with his own teeth and wash his muzzle to the eyes in warm blood. Wow. The description here makes us think that in some ways he's akin or similar to humans, but here we really begin to see his animal instincts taking over. There is an ecstasy that marks the summit of life and beyond which life cannot rise. And such is the paradox of living. This ecstasy comes when one is most alive, and it comes as a complete forgetfulness that one is alive. This ecstasy, this forgetfulness of living, comes to the artist, caught up and out of himself in a sheet of flame. It comes to the soldier, war-mad on a stricken field in refusing quarter. And it came to Buck, leading the pack, sounding the old wolf cry, straining after the food that was alive and that fled swiftly before him through the moonlight. 
He was sounding the deeps of his nature, and of the parts of his nature that were deeper than he, going back to the womb of time. He was mastered by the sheer surging of life, the tidal wave of being, the perfect joy of each separate muscle, joint and sinew, in that it was everything that was not death, that it was a glow and rampant, expressing itself in movement, flying exultantly under the stars and over the face of dead matter that did not move. Jack London spent so much time in his description of these things that seemed like they could be easy or, or said much more simply. So why is he taking the time to describe this rabbit chase? I've given you a few things to think about, but I really want you to think about our theme, our topic, the overcoming of adversity. If we just simply said that Buck chased a rabbit and a bunch of dogs were in the way and they really had this deep desire to get it, okay, we use some adjectives, that'd be great. But here, the wording is driving you along. It's pushing you onward. It gives an urgency, and it almost tries to emulate the chase itself. So we really start to see a moment where Buck is actually attempting to overcome some of his adversity, and we're feeling it with him. That is the beautiful thing about descriptions like this. But Spitz, cold and calculating even in his supreme moods, left the pack and cut across a narrow neck of land where the creek made a long bend around. Buck did not know of this, and as he rounded the bend, the frost wraith of a rabbit still flitting before him, he saw another and larger frost wraith leap up from the overhanging bank into the immediate path of the rabbit. It was Spitz. The rabbit could not turn, and as the white teeth broke its back in mid-air, it shrieked as loudly as a stricken man may shriek. At sound of this, the cry of life plunging down from life's apex in the grip of death. The fall pack at Buck's heels raised a hell's chorus of delight. Interesting. He capitalized life and death as though they're characters here. There's a poem that I'm going to share with you that does the same. But for now, we're going to take a look at this. Okay, so life and death here are capitalized. Here are a couple poems that I would like to show you uh, in which the authors do something similar. And in class, we're actually going to spend some time taking a look at these, but I just want to give you a glimpse of two different poems that you will eventually be familiar with. This one by Emily Dickinson is Because I Could Not Stop for Death. She was a profound poet. Because I could not stop for death, capitalized, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. All these things she's turning into characters. By capitalizing, making them proper nouns, she's now making them people. Not necessarily people as in living, breathing human beings, but actual characters with which she interacts. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure, too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill. For only gossamer, my gown, my tippet, only tulle. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horse's head were toward eternity. We'll get into the details of what this poem actually means, but this is one famous example, and I want you to think, how on earth could this poem and the characters of the cry of life and the grip of death be related? Also, there's this poem by Rudyard Kipling. It's less uh, relatable, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But if we do take a brief look, 
this is an amazing poem, and I want you to to read it for yourselves someday. It's it's fabulous. I have it hanging in my house. But here, it's basically, if you can do all of these things, then you'll be a man. That's his whole point of the poem. You will have grown up. You will be an amazing person. But within the poem, he talks about meeting with triumph and disaster as, again, characters. They're things that you encounter, but they're almost like characters. They're your adversaries. So coming back to the call of the wild, how are these adversaries or antagonists? Talk about it with your neighbors. Then we'll keep going. Buck did not cry out. He did not check himself, but drove in upon Spitz, shoulder to shoulder, so hard that he missed the throat. They rolled over and over in the powdery snow. Spitz gained his feet almost as though he had not been overthrown, slashing Buck down the shoulder and leaping clear. Twice his teeth clipped together, like the steel jaws of a trap, as he backed away for better footing, with lean and lifting lips that writhed and snarled. In a flash, Buck knew it the time had come. It was to the death. As they circled about, snarling, ears laid back, keenly watchful for the advantage. The scene came to Buck with a sense of familiarity. He seemed to remember it all. The white woods and earth and moonlight and the thrill of battle. Over the whiteness and silence brooded a ghostly calm. There was not the faintest whisper of air, nothing moved, not a leaf quivered, the visible breaths of the dogs rising slowly and lingering in the frosty air. They had made short work of the snowshoe rabbit, these dogs that were ill-tamed wolves, and they were now drawn up in an expectant circle. They, too, were silent, their eyes only gleaming and their breaths drifting slowly upward. To Buck it was nothing new or strange, the scene of old time. It was as though it had always been the wanted way of things. Spitz was a practice fighter. From Spitzbergen through the Arctic and across Canada and the Barrens, he had held his own with all manner of dog and achieved mastery to mastery over them. Bitter rage was his, but never blind rage. In passion to rend and destroy, he never forgot that his enemy was in like passion to rend and destroy. He never rushed ill till he was he never rushed till he was prepared to receive a rush, never attacked till he had first defended that attack. In vain, Buck strove to sink his teeth in the neck of the big white dog. Wherever his fangs struck for the softer flesh, they were countered by the fangs of Spitz. Fang clashed fang, and lips were cut and bleeding, but Buck could not penetrate his enemy's guard. Then he warmed up and enveloped Spitz in a whirlwind of rushes. Time and time again he tried for the snow-white throat, where life bubbled near to the surface, and each time and every time Spitz slashed him and got away. Then Buck took to rushing, as though for the throat, when suddenly, drawing back his head and curving in from the side, he would drive his shoulder at the shoulder of Spitz, as a ram by which to overthrow him. But instead, Buck's shoulder was slashed down each time as Spitz leaped lightly away. Spitz was untouched, while Buck was streaming with blood and panting hard, the fight was growing desperate, and all the while the silent and wolfish circle waited to finish off whichever dog went down. As Buck grew winded, Spitz took to rushing, and he kept him staggering of her footing. Once Buck went over, and the whole circle of sixty dogs started up, but he recovered himself, almost in midair, and the circle sank down again and waited. There's so much tension in the description here. Let's see where it goes. But Buck possessed a quality that made for greatness, imagination. He fought by instinct, but he could fight by head as well. He rushed as though attempting the old shoulder trick, but at the last instant swept low to the snow and in. His teeth closed on Spitz's left foreleg. There was a crunch of breaking bone, and the white dog faced him on three legs. Thrice he tried to knock him over, then repeated the trick and broke the right foreleg. Despite the pain and helplessness, Spitz struggled madly to keep up. He saw the silent circle with gleaming eyes, lolling tongues, and silvery breaths drifting upward, 
closing in upon him as he had seen similar circles close in upon beaten antagonists in the past, only this time he was the one who was beaten. There was no hope for him. Buck was inexorable. Mercy was a thing reserved for gentler climbs. He maneuvered for the final rush. The circle had tightened till he could feel the breasts of the huskies on his flanks. He could see them, beyond spits and to either side, half crouching for the spring, their eyes fixed upon him. A pause seemed to fall. Every animal was motionless, as though turned to stone. Only Spitz quivered and bristled as he staggered back and forth, snarling with horrible menace, as though to frighten off impending death. Then Buck sprang in and out, but while he was in, shoulder had at last squarely met shoulder. The dark circle became a dot on the moon-flooded snow as Spitz disappeared from view. Buck stood and looked on, the successful champion, the dominant primordial beast who had made his kill and found it good. We're going to pick up with chapter four next time, but for now, stop and think. What adversity has been overcome here? What other adversity still remains?